This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is the next reading of the wonderful book The History of the Inquisition from Philip Limborch, written in 1692 and uh, translated by Samuel Chandler in 1731 into the English language. We have last time uh, finished the volume one of this two volume work. That volume one was uh, <laughs> even though that I've read it now I still don't get it I think it was a almost a cooperation of the two authors of uh, Philip van Limbodge and of uh, Samuel Chandler because there was much information in <clears throat> that Philip van Limbodge never could have known because he even died in the beginning of the 17th cen uh, 18th century but um, Samuel Chandler, of course, put in there some things, and he had a, ded had a dedication in the beginning of the very uh, of the very book to the Queen of England at that time. And um, we're gonna continue today in Volume Two with a dedication to the Most Reverend Father in God John, Lord Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate and Metropolitan of all England. So this is the beginning of Volume Two, and um, this is gonna be really about the Inquisition that we haven't touched on that much yet because we have more studied the history of the Roman Catholic Church and all the councils which also was quite interesting and the different persecutions that took place but okay let's continue now may it please your grace the book which I now publish and my history of the Inquisition prefixed to it so you see that was a part of the author himself and a part of the Translator, Volume 1, that we read, appeared to me worthy of your grace's patronage, rather than any other person's living, when I considered the subject treated of in both of them, and that, this, uh, that, and that high station which in these most difficult times you support with the greatest honor and universal 
universal applause of all good men for the common advantage of the reformed churches. The advantage of the reformed churches. Therefore this book was dedicated and therefore this book also was written. And um, what is the common advantage of the reformed churches today in 2017? Thanks to everybody believing in the future Antichrist and the ecumenical movement, the advantage of the reformed churches is to go back to Rome. Now the book itself contains the sentences of, Toulouse, uh, of the Toulouse Inquisition pronounced during the space of uh, 16 years, principally against the Albigenses and Valdenses, about the beginning of the 14th century. In these sentences there are not only many curious things which greatly illustrate the histories of those times, but the Inquisition itself and the method of its procedure is represented uh, by about 100 sentences pronounced by it and held up as it were in glass to be discerned by all. From hence even the papacy itself, which principally is supported by cruelty and persecution, may be more fully known which to covered with sheep's clothing to deceive the unwary cherishes a wolf in its bosom. My history of the Inquisition gives light to the book of sentences. My design in it was to give a representation of that tribunal, not in a false disguise, nor deformed by unnatural or hideous colors, but in living and genuine ones. I mean, to draw the picture of that horrible court, which makes a principal boast of the title of sanctity, sanctity to the life, not from the writings of those who separate from the Church of Rome, but that, are may, but that there may be no room f for calumny from those of the popish doctors and even inquisitors themselves, that hereby the vast power granted to the inquisitors the most cruel laws of it and the unjust method of procedure, quite different from the usage of all other courts, might appear to the whole world and that hereby the papacy itself might be known to all mankind to what it really is. Again, this was an example of a very long sentence when we have a look at this. Yeah? Quite long. But the last few words are actually that what it, all, what it is all about, or what it should be all about. That hereby the methods of procedure of the courts of the Inquisition the papacy itself might be known to all mankind to what it really is. What is the papacy really? What should all mankind know what it is? Well, the Pope is the Antichrist. He is the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist. Yeah? There is no way around it. And books like this with the Inquisition, they prove that. And the history proves it. And the book of Daniel and many assertions by the Apostle Paul and of course the book of Revelation from the Apostle John reveals that the Pope is the Antichrist. And that's what it actually is all about. To expose the Antichrist by his works. It is already said in the Bible, by their fruits you will know them. What are the fruits? The fruits can only come from works, right? And the Roman Catholic Church says that even without works, without the sacraments in her, there is no salvation. So just look at what works she is doing to quote-unquote get, get, get saved, right? And then you will see what her works are and then you will see what her fruits are. And the author makes it very clear here that hereby, just look at the Inquisition, uh, look at the Inquisition, what we are doing in this book, itself might be known to all mankind to be what the papacy really is. Hereby, the papacy shows its real color. You don't have to look into all the official statements and the things they say officially. Just look at that what they have done in the past. Connect the history that has passed with the right people, in this case the papacy. 
so that hereby the papacy itself might be known to all mankind what it really is, is the Antichrist. For indeed there is nothing that more evidently discovers in nature than that immense and supreme power by which the Pope of Rome, claiming to be the vicar of Christ on earth, <coughs> makes himself the judge of the faith and usurps dominion over the consciences of the faithful. And of this the office of the Inquisition is the most abundant proof. For here the Pope, as supreme legislator, makes laws by which he endeavors to bind, under the most severe penalties, all who wear the name of Christ without accepting those of the highest rank. No, not princes and kings to obey and believe all things which are established by the canons of the Church of Rome. And as supreme judge of the faith he erects himself a tribunal, from the judgment of which none of the faithful are exempted. He sends his inquisitors into all provinces and countries who, as judges delegated by him, exercise judgment in his name, in the Pope's name, and make all magistrates and princes obedient to their commands, as though they were the commands of the Pope himself. And that it may appear that he sets himself up as God, he endeavors to search out the most concealed things and, as far as he can, the very thoughts of the heart. He commands the most private affairs transacted between the most intimate friends to be informed of to the inquisitors, if there appears to be the least suspicion of a wavering faith under his most severe threatening, under this most severe threatening, that if any one doth not immediately discover what he hath heard and seen, he shall be esteemed as an accomplice in the crime and as an hinderer of the holy office of the Inquisition, that by this means, even from the smallest proofs, he may form a judgment of the very thoughts or by the most cruel tortures draw out a confession of everything harbored in the mind or at least punished the action or word that gave occasion to the suspicion. And that it may more evidently appear that this tribunal is erected not for the honor, but rather for the reproach of Christ. He ordains those punishments and exercises those judgments, not against the profane and impious violate and pious violators of the divine laws, thieves, adulterers, drunkards, revilers, and the like, concerning whom the scripture plainly pronounces that they shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven, but against the transgressors of his laws, not the laws of God, but the, laws of, uh, the, the transgressors against his laws, which without any foundation in the word of God he hath by an insolent usurpation of spiritual power laid on the church of God as a yoke to distinguish all who are subject to him, so that if any one doth not observe the least ceremony he commands, sacraments, or not believe what is ordered by him to be believed, although he is persuaded by the clear testimony of the word of God that he ought to act and believe otherwise, or give the least proof of such a belief, he can't escape the cruel hands of the inquisitors so that by these fruits tis evident he prefers his own commandments to the divine. Meaning, the law of the Pope stands above the law of the God of the Bible. Is that a little bit daring to say that? No, because the Roman Catholic Church itself says it is not the Bible alone, but the Bible and the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. And this tradition of the Roman Catholic Church actually stands above the Bible. So when they say that the tradition, which is inaugurated, of course, by the Pope, who is the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, stands above the Bible, which is the word of God, the Pope exalts himself above God. And that is one of the characteristics of Antichrist. It's simple as that. <coughs> you just have to read the Bible and understand that. And this last sentence here made that quite clear. So that by these fruits, 
look at the works and look at the fruits, it is evident he prefers his own commandments to the divine commandments. The divine commandments aren't interesting. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was George W. Bush who said the Constitution of the United States of America is a GD paper. Yeah, I don't even explain that, but you know what is meant by that. Yeah, it's a GD paper. Well, the Roman Catholic Church thinks the same of the writings of the Word of God, of the Bible. They want to get rid of the Bible. They falsify it, they teach it wrongly. That's all they can do for the moment. They want to get rid of it. But as God said in the Bible, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. And since the Bible is his word, his word will not pass away. They cannot extinguish the Bible from the world. But they are trying to do everything to do that. And to lure everybody into wrong Bibles as they go along. Now on the other hand, the author continues, all who desire to preserve the purity and liberty of the gospel everywhere highly esteem and honor your grace, who, as you preside over the Church of England, by far the most eminent of all the Reformed churches, are for this reason, I had almost said, their common defender. You, by methods and counsels directly contrary to the papal tyranny, labor with great success to promote the Christian doctrine and faith and to bring men into the way of salvation. For, not to mention your grace's chaste and natural eloquence in preaching, so agreeable to the holy scriptures, the strength and forth of your judgment in arguing, your learning not for ostination, but usefulness and those other excellent qualifications which formerly drew the hopes and eyes of all good men upon you, and for which you are now an ornament to your procession. The great godness of the great goodness of your mind, so highly becoming an evangelical pastor, gives a happy pre uh, pref uh, presage to the reform uh, to the Reformation even now in danger, and lately almost oppressed. For such is the integrity of your life, such the simplicity and candor of your behavior, such your charity and benevolence to all, such your wisdom from long experience, that you seem to have been chosen by divine providence, by your conduct to unite and strengthen the reformed churches, to heal their differences, and to advance and defend the gospel, liberty, and Christian religion against the attempts and savage cruelty of the papists. For you not only approve, but are a pattern of true gospel charity. You oppose the papal tyranny and barbarity by purity of life and gentleness of disposition, the very methods by which Christianity formerly overcame and destroyed idolatry, and the heathen impiety and tyranny, and by which it always will triumph over its enemies. I could not therefore submit this work to any but your grace's protection, and persuade myself you will with me judge it to be seasonable, especially uh, especially in this state of affairs, in which the papacy is endeavouring, especially in England, to erect itself again and usurp the sole dominion, that in this treatise all men may see, as in a glass, its living and genuine representation, and never suffer themselves to be deceived by a false and distinguished uh, and disguised appearance, but acknowledge it to be what it really is, meaning an assembly and combination of cruel and bloody men who, <clears throat> who effect and usurp wherever they can a dominion over conscience and thus erect a kingdom <clears throat> erect a kingdom opposite to that of Christ's. That by this means they may, under your conduct and government as a truly spiritual father, learn to abhor and with all their hearts to detect that imperious society and oppose the propagation of it by faith unfeigned, a charity truly Christian, and by sanctity of behavior, and that they may also consult the safety of the Reformed Church, and especially learn from thence to abhor all cruelty and punishment 
towards dissenters and erroneous persons, in other respects pious, as those who know that we must all give an account to of uh, uh, that we must all give an account of our faith before the tribunal of Christ, the supreme lawgiver and judge, and that it is not lawful for any man to give a law to consciences or prescribe the rules of believing, because this is in reality to ascend the tribunal of Christ himself. Thus, the Church will prosper and flourish under your grace's care. Enmities, hatred and schisms, which have miserably divided it into parties, will be destroyed. And if God offended us with for our sin, shall not vouch... Wow, can you read that word? <laughs> uh, I can't. I have to take a break here. Okay, I will read that sentence again because I couldn't read that word. It's a vouch safe. I, I didn't even know that word. So, uh, let me start this sentence again. Where does it start? Here. Thus the church will prosper and flourish under your grace's care. Enmities, hatred and schisms, which have miserably divided it into parties, will be destroyed. And if God, offended with us for our sins, shall not vouchsafe to restore to us those golden ages of the primitive church, in which all the faithful were of one heart and of one mind, yet that we may all at least learn this from hence, not to rule over another's conscience, never to punish an erroneous Christian for a mere harmless mistake, never to put to death anyone for an ingenious profession of his faith, of which he is ready to give an account to God, but to refute their errors by the force of reason and the plain testimony of Scripture, and in the meanwhile to, uh, in the meanwhile to wait with gentleness and patience for their repentance, if peradventure God should grant them to understand their errors and give them an heart sincerely to embrace the truth. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the blood of the everlasting covenant, prosper all your most pious endeavors for the peace and safety of the church, and grant that you may happily restore it when fallen and support it when tottering by the same aids with which it first grew, increased and was established. These are the sincere and most affectionate prayers of, may it please your grace, your grace's most humble and devoted servant, Philip A. Limborch. The dedication of the book, starting the second volume of the History of the Inquisition. And we are going to continue reading Mr. Limborch's preface to the reader. So here the author addresses the reader himself, which he does through all the book, because why would you otherwise write a book? But actually, okay, here is something that he says uh, is very important to him, and he gives the reader a message himself. Um, okay. When first I determined to publish the book of the sentences of the Toulouse Inquisition, I had reason to think that it would be the same with others as I found it with myself, meaning that several things in those sentences would not be very clear, unless the nature of the Inquisition and method of proceeding in it were in some measure understood, and therefore I intended for the reader's advantage to prefix uh, to prefix it to a dissertation concerning the Inquisition. But, as I turned over the authors who treated of this affair, I found such plenty of matter that I laid by my first design and resolved to write an entire history of the Inquisition. Whether I have answered expectations, the reader must judge. I am sure I was not wanting in the desire to serve him. The history itself I have comprehended in four books, in which I have so fully explained everything relating to the Inquisition, and that could clear up the books of sentences that I am persuaded the reader will find no obscurity left when he peruses, peruses, peruses them. 
<laughs> sometimes a difficult word. He will perceive by the laws and bulls everywhere published against heretics why such a punishment is inflicted upon each person and the crimes objected to the criminals and why the sentences are conceived in these and no other words. And although the punishments and joint penitents by way of the wholesome penance are arbitrary and left to the pleasure of the, inquisitor, uh, of the inquisitors, yet they are directed by some certain laws and customs. So then, upon bearing the crimes read objected, read objected to any criminal, it may, from thence, be easily gathered to what penance he is to be condemned, according to the laws and customs received in the Inquisition. I have not, through an attachment to any party, written anything contrary to the truth. I have made use of popish authors, yea, inquisitors themselves, and counsellors of the Inquisition, who are so far from having written anything untrue, out of hatred to the Inquisition, that they every cry up the sanctity of it, and, without end or measure, inculculate its vast advantage to the Church of Rome. And therefore, whatever they write concerning the Inquisition and method of proceeding before that tribunal, I assured myself I might safely relate without any charge of calumny or account of it. And to cut off all pretense, or to cut off all pretense for such a charge, I thought proper to retain the very words of the popish doctors, as they are extant in their own books, without any alteration, unless where, because of their prolif uh, prolificness, I have abridged them. And even then, I have made use of their own words, as far as the nature of an abridgment would allow, so that he who reads my history of the Inquisition will read not, such, not so much my words as those of the Inquisitors themselves and other popish doctors. So I hope that you got a little bit where uh, the author Philip from Limborch went for when he, when he told you that. So that he who reads my history, watches this video, me reading this, reading it for yourself, you can download the book for yourself from the internet, the link is provided in the description box of the video. He who reads my history will read not so much my words, the author's words, but those of the inquisitors themselves and other popish doctors means that this book is put together from words out of the horse's mouth itself. It is the Roman Catholic Church. You know, when you ever have a chance, <laughs> which you will never have, but if you ever have a chance, to go into the secret library of the Vatican, to the archives, where people like Alberto Rivera and others, of course, were in, when you have a possibility to go in there, you will find books over books over books written with names that the Inquisition tortured and killed throughout centuries of Inquisition. You will find hundreds, thousands, even millions of names. You will find how these people were tortured, which methods were used, when they were first interrogated, when the torture started and when they were killed. You will find all that in the archives of the Vatican. And Philip Limbwatch must have had access to these because he says that he uses the words of the Inquisitors themselves. So it must have been accessible to him. Because at that time the Inquisition was still living and those books were probably more or less, I don't know, kind of available. We will see whatever he uses, but you have to understand that this book is not about the words of an author, but it is actually a, um, how do you say that, um, it's, a, it's a testimony of the Church, of the Inquisition itself. Now the author continues here, 
I thought I should hereby greatly serve the public by showing what sort of court that of the Inquisition is, the Papists and Inquisitors themselves being witnesses. Amongst all the authors I have quoted, R. Gonsalvius Montanus is the only one that was a Protestant, and, as far as I can gather from, the, from his book, was one of those who, about the death of the Emperor Charles V, gathered a church for worshipping God in a purer manner at Seville, upon discovering the grievous errors and superstitions of the Church of Rome, which was afterwards dispersed by that most cruel inquisition, and which were held acts of uh, and which were held acts of faith at Seville and Valladolid in 1559. But I have scarce anything from him but what is affirmed by other authors. He only supplies me with instances fully to illustrate what others write concerning the Inquisition, the laws of it, and methods of proceeding. To him, uh, to him I may add James Usser, Archbishop of Armagh, from whose treatise, the Succession, uh, I have borrowed some few things. But inasmuch as even these things were taken from popish authors, of whom there are frequent quotations in that treatise, that I have transcribed from, uh, from thence, ought in justice to have the same authority with the papists as though I had quoted it from the very authors whose words are made use of by that most learned prelate. The reader may perhaps wonder at one thing, that I have always called those heretics that have been proceeded against by the uh, Inquisition. But, as I was relating, as I was relating the Pope's bulls and the decrees of the Popish councils, I could not help using the same words I found in them. By an heretic, therefore, I understand and condemned for heresy by the Church of uh, one, uh, by an heretic, therefore, I understand one condemned for heresy by the Church of Rome. I could not rehearse their decrees but in their own words, and was therefore forced always to use them unless I would have interrupted the course of the history by repeated and immunerable alterations, and thereby rendered it less pleasing and acceptable. Let it therefore suffice once and for all to say that by the word heretic, whenever I speak of the Inquisition against heretics, I do not mean one who is truly an heretic, but accounted an heretic by the Church of Rome, taking the word in the popish sense of it. So in other words, what does he try to explain here? When he uses the word heretic, he uses in the, in the explanation as it is given in the uh, in the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, he uses the word heretic as the, Roman, the Romans use it, but just to make sure that we always speak about the same thing. So who is a heretic in the eyes of the author when he writes this book? Not because he condemns him that way, but what he mentions in this book, a heretic is someone who is a Bible believer, someone who believes and follows Jesus Christ, who follows the laws of Jesus Christ, who is a Sabbath keeper, who is a keeper of the commandments, who is saved by Jesus Christ and our Lord, who was probably baptized even and born again. Those are the heretics because they are against the Church of Rome. And those are the ones the author speaks here about. So it is not because he, you know, he has to use the terms of the Roman Catholic Church to make it understandable to us. He cannot every time say, okay, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is some other um, that, that I am meaning. So uh, he uses the word heretics as Rome does. But of course he is not agreeing with it. And that's the point that he actually wants to make. Now in the meanwhile, those who are heretics in their account are not so in mine. And I sincerely believe that those which the Church of Rome hath condemned for heresy have died and gloriously endured the punishments of fire for the, test, uh, for the testimony of Jesus Christ and the maintaining a good conscience. These few things 
I thought proper to advise my kind reader of, and hope it will pass a favorable judgment. September the 13th, Anno Domini, 1692, as we can read here in Roman letters. Okay, by the way, you see at this time the M was not yet invented for the, mil for the thousand years. Um, that's why 1692 is written this way. No? The M came later. That's why 666 is identified when you count up all the numerals that existed at that time in Latin. No? 1, 5, 10, 50, 100, 500. Count that up. It counts up to 666. The M came later, and you see that here very well. So, we go to the next part of the book, which is on the, the next page. It's a catalogue of the authors out of, those, out of whose writing the history of the Inquisition is principally drawn. Now, this gives us the Directorium Inquisitorum direct, direct in the beginning. And um, <clears throat> I have spoken about the Directorium Inquisitorium when I read Rulers of Evil and even gave an excerpt of what is in there. So here we have uh, more or less the library that he went through, all the different books that he went to and uh, that he cites and that he uses to, to make his book. And then we go into the contents in book one. Uh, we read already uh, volume one that's behind us. And here we have the different books and all the volumes. And I hope that uh, everything will be in this PDF here because I bought this part two uh, to have it as a physical copy all here. But uh, the, the quality is so much worse than this, what I'm reading online here that I keep myself to this online book and uh, by that you can follow my reading as I scroll down reading as I did in all the last videos also and I will continue doing that okay so here we now actually start with the history of the Inquisition uh, chapter 1 the doctrine of Jesus Christ forbids persecution on the account of religion you know, we were speaking in the beginning of this book of the persecution on the accounts of religion uh, in the introduction in part one. But, of course, the doctrine of Jesus Christ forbids persecution on the account of religion. We are to use the two-edged sword of the Bible. Now, although the very name of the Inquisition was not so much as heard of in the Christian Church before the 13th century, yet having now spread it itself almost throughout the whole world and become everywhere notorious, it is not to be wondered at that there should be a general curiosity in mankind of more thoroughly understanding it and knowing by what laws it is constituted. And what are the methods of proceeding therein? The doctors of the Romish Church give it the highest commendations, commendations as the only and most certain means of extirpating heresies and an impregnable support of the faiths. Not invented by human wisdom and counsel, but given to men by the immediate influence of heaven whose tribunal breath breathes nothing but holiness, and to which they, ha they give such titles as denote the most perfect sanctity. The Inquisition itself is called the Holy Office, the prison of the Inquisition, the Holy House, so that the very name raises its respect and veneration. Yea, they go so far as to compare it with the sun and affirm sun s u n no? and affirm that it, that as it would be accounted ridiculous to command and extol the sun it would be equally so to pretend and praise the inquisition the protestants on the other hand represent it not only as a cruel and bloody but most unjust tribunal 
where, as the laws by which other tribunals are governed and disregarded for many things, which where else would be esteemed unrighteous, are commanded as holy. And they are so far from thinking that it is a proper means of restraining or punishing the guilty, which is the principal thing to be aimed at by, ver by every tribunal, that on the contrary they believe it was invented for the oppression of the truth and the defense of superstition and tyranny. <laughs> That's a true word, yeah. Where persons in their innocency appear to bright as bright as the sun at noonday are treated as the most vile and perfidious wretches and cruelty and cruelly put to death by the severest tortures. I therefore thought it might be of service to the world to describe the origin of this tribunal and against whom and by what methods they generally proceed in it. In order to this, it is necessary to look back and deduce this whole affair from the very original. I'm going to see if I can make this a little bit bigger and easier to read then. Yeah, that's not so bad and we still have place to do this. Okay. Now, the Christian religion taught by the inspired apostles made its progress in the world and showed itself to be of divine original by the holiness of its precepts, the exceeding greatness of its promises and the many miracles wrought in confirmation of it, and at last brought the whole world into its obedience without the assistance of carnal weapons or temporal power. Our Lord himself expected only a voluntary obedience from mankind as he required only to be worshipped in spirit, and commanded everyone that would be his disciple to deny himself, which is the proper work of the mind and soul, and cannot be effected by any external violence whatsoever. Even God the Father himself heretofore, in order to represent the nature of the kingdom of his Son, Jesus Christ, showed it unto Daniel under the figure of the Son of Man, whilst the other kingdoms of this world were denoted by the images of wild beasts. For no other cause, undoubtedly, but to show the different nature of Christ's kingdom from the kingdoms of this world. These are to be erected, enlarged, and preserved by violence and arms, and measures fierce and, beast, uh, and bestial, his by mildness, gentleness, and the weight of arguments, in order to convince and not to offer uh, force to the mind. The precepts of the gospel breathe nothing but charity and love. Our Lord calls charity his new commandment, by which he would have all men know and distinguish his disciples. But there is nothing to op uh, so opposite to charity as the punishing an erroneous person who believes he promotes the divine glory by his error, and in defense of it, and in defense of it is ready to undergo the most cruel and shameful death. Our Saviour sent his disciples like sheep into the midst of wolves in order to bear testimony to the gospel by their patience under sufferings and hereby spread the divine Saviour of it through the world. It was far from his design that like wolves they should tear and devour the sheep or that they should violently compel those by the terrors and torments of death to embrace his religion whom they could not gain by the force of arguments. Besides, all agree that faith is the gift of God, and therefore can never be produced by human force, nor can God be prevailed on by external violence to communicate this his excellent gift. The mind is to be convinced by arguments. The tongue and bodily members may be forced by external violences but this can never extort from anyone a real belief of that to be true, which he is persuaded in his mind is false. Yeah, I have to read that one again. Huh? 
The mind is to be convinced by arguments. The tongue and bodily members may be forced by external violence, but this can never extort from anyone a real belief of that to be true, which is he persuaded in his mind is false, so that nothing can be more directly opposite to the genius of Christianity than, the per than to persecute the erroneous, to expose them under the infamous name of heretics to the fury of the mob and punish them with a cruel death. Now, nor are we to think that these gentle means of propagating Christianity were proper only for the time of its first appearance, when the Church was destitute of the civil power, and by the reason of, this, uh, of its opposition to the prevailing religions of the world, drew upon itself the anger and fury of the princes of it. But that the case is now altered, since the kings and rulers, upon their conversion of, to the faith, are obliged to subject their scepters to Jesus Christ. They are obliged to subject their scepters to Jesus Christ, not to the so-called vicar of Christ, who is the papacy here in the world, who is a usurper of the seat of Jesus Christ. For the change of fortune makes no change in his religion, nor can the alteration of any worldly affairs take away the force and obligation of his commands. For Christ, by his apostles, preached one scheme of doctrines to last forever. It is true that kings are, so sub, uh, are to submit their scepters to Christ, not by forcing men with punishments in opposition to his commands, to profess contrary to their conscience and real sentiments what they believe to be false, and so to fill his church with hypocrites instead of true believers but by ordaining equal and just laws agreeable to the gospel precepts for the preservation of the public, public tranquillity, and that there may be nothing to obstruct the true spiritual worship of God and the salvation of souls. This is that most, har uh, that most harmless and yet most powerful method of propagating the gospel, agreeable to its nature and genius, by which in the beginning it was spread in a short time throughout the whole world by a few weak and defenseless persons, instructed only by the Divine Spirit through the weight of its arguments and the power of its miracles, and by which it may be still propagated and preserved, pure and uncorrupt, against all the attempts of unbelievers and heretics. For our Lord did not furnish his disciples with carnal weapons to oppose the frauds, impostures, violence and persecutions of the world, but with spiritual weapons, which through God are powerful to bring every imagination into captivity to the obedience of Christ, that they might triumph over the world in the midst of afflictions, by their innocence, by their simplicity, fortitude and patience. So far indeed was he from ordaining um, from ordaining persecutions as the punishment of error that he commands his church when suffering persecutions to pray for those that persecuted. We have to pray for our enemies and do good to them that hate us and persecute us. That's the biblical reference to what the author says here. By this means, the church in the beginning was founded, and so wonderfully propagated throughout the whole world in its first and purest ages. Starting with chapter 2. The opinion of the primitive Christians concerning persecution. Agreeable to this practice was the universal and constant doctrine of these times, for the primitive Christians opposed with the greatest vigor all cruelty and persecution for the sake of religion. Yeah? Primitive Christians opposed with the greatest vigor all cruelty and persecution for the sake of religion. 
So this is what the primitive Christians did, meaning the very first Christians, meaning the apostles, the founders of the real church of Jesus Christ, they opposed with the greatest vigor all cruelty and persecution for the sake of religion. Turn this 180 degrees around and you got what came out of the church when it became apostate, when the big falling away came and the son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist was revealed. It turned 180 degrees around and the Inquisition is proof of that. Primitive Christians opposed the greatest, uh, with the greatest vigor all cruelty and persecution for the sake of religion. The Roman Catholic Church only uses with the greatest vigor cruelty, persecution, violence for the sake of quote-unquote religion. It is true indeed that they condemned the heathen for their, barbar for their barbarities and argued wholly for this that Christians should have the free exercise of their religion granted them. But they used such arguments and topics of, re uh, of reasoning, and even sometimes when treating of different subjects, expressed themselves in such a manner as plainly declares that they do equally condemn all sort of violence for the sake of religion, against all persons whatsoever. Thus, Tertullian, in his Apology, and uh, probably page 24, says, quote, from Tertullian, take heed that this be not made use of to the praise of impiety, meaning to take away from men the liberty of religion and forbid them the choice of their deity, so that it should be criminal for them to worship whom they would, and they should be compelled to worship whom they would not. No one would accept of an involuntary service, no, not a man. And in the 28th chapter he says, It plainly appears unjust that men, possessed, uh, that men possessed of liberty and choice should be compelled against their will to sacrifice. For in other cases, a willing mind is required in the performance of divine worship. And it may justly be accounted ridiculous to force any person to honor the gods whom he ought willingly, for his own sake, to endeavor to appease. And again, in his book Scapula, from Tertullian, chapter 2, quote, Everyone hath a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion, for no man's religion can be either hurtful or profitable to his neighbor. Did you read this, what Tertullian said? Everyone has a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. Now, why is this a very important sentence? I tell you. Because Tom Fress, when studying Roman Catholicism a few years ago, and I think it was about 2008, during the visit of the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI at that time to the United States of America, watched EWTN, you know, that's Eternal uh, Catholic Network uh, Television, that, that is the uh, propaganda channel of the Roman Catholic Church, if you can say it so. And he saw a discussion between, I, I, I don't want to use any wrong words, but I think it was a, a bishop or somebody high up anyway in the Roman Catholic Church and um, one of the people of the television station, and that guy from the Roman Catholic Church said that no man has the right to choose his own religion. And what does Tertullian say? Everyone hath a natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. And the Roman Catholic Church officially denies that. The Roman Catholic Church says no man has the right to his own religion. Or better said, to choose his own religion. 
But Tertullian says, everyone has the natural right and power to worship according to his persuasion. For no man's religion, he continues, can be either hurtful or profitable to his neighbor. That's the point. When I live out my belief according to my God, I am not hurting my neighbor. Nor, the author continues, nor can it be a part of religion to compel men to religion, which ought to be voluntary, um, uh, voluntarily embraced, and not through constraint, since this expected, that even your sacrifices should be offered with a willing mind, so that if you compel us to sacrifice, think not to please our gods, uh, think not to please your gods, for unless they delight in strife, they will not desire unwilling sacrifices. But God is not a lover of contention. Cyprian also agrees with Tertullian, his master, in his 62nd letter to Pomponius concerning virgins, where, treating of the excommunication of offenders, he thus speaks, quote, God commanded that those who would not obey his priests and those judges which time after time be appointed should be slain. Such were cut off with the sword during the dispensation of the circumcision in the flesh. But now, since the spiritual circumcision takes place in all the faithful servants of God, the proud and obstinate, obstinate ark uh, ark to be slain um, with uh, the spiritual sword by the being cast out of the church. And in his 51st letter to Maximus, the presbyter, disputing against those who separated themselves from the church, he speaks to them in this manner, quote, Since upon our deliverance from prison you became infected with an heretical and schismatical opinion, so it was that all our glory remained in prison behind you. There you seem to have left the dignity of your character, since you, the soldiers of Christ, returned not to the church when you came from your imprisonment, who went to the imprisonment with the condemnation and applauses of the church. For though there may be tears in the, there may be tears in the church, this ought to be no obstruction to our faith and charity nor is it there being in the church any reason for our departure or out of it. It should be our care that we, f uh, that, we, that we be found the true wheat, that when the master shall gather it into his granaries, we may reap the fruit of our work and labor." Unquote. Now the apostle in his epistle to the Corinthians, Paul is that, says, that in a large house there are not only vessels of God and silver, but of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. Let us endeavor as much as we can to be found amongst those of gold and silver. It is the sole prerogative of the Lord to break the earthen ones, to whom the iron rod is committed. The servant cannot be greater than his Lord, nor should any one arrogate him, uh, to himself what the Father has committed to the Son only, meaning to winnow and perch the flower and separate by any human judgment the chaff from the wheat. And in his 55th to chapter here to Cornelius, quote, Nor let anyone wonder that some should forsake the servant appointed over them, when the disciples left the Lord himself, though he wrought the greatest signs and wonders and proved by the testimony of his works that he acted by the power of his Father. And yet he did not reproach or grievously threaten them when, he, uh, when they forsook him, but gently turned to his apostles and said, what and, will, what and will you forsake me also? Observing that sacred laws of every one's being left to his own liberty and will, and making for himself his own choice, whether of death, whether of life or death, and a little after to the same purpose, 
As for your part, most dear brother, we are in conscience obliged to endeavor that no one perish from the church through our default. But if any one destroys himself and will not repent and return to the church, we endeavored their salvation shall be uh, we who endeavored their salvation shall be without blame in the day of judgment, and, the, and they only remain in punishment, who would not be healed by our salutary admon uh, admonitions. And since from these pas uh, end quote, and since from these passages it, is, uh, it plainly appears that Cyprian taught that all force and matters of religion is contrary to the nature of Christianity, is contrary to the nature of Christ. I cannot but take notice of the dishonesty of Bellarmine, Cardinal Bellarmine, yeah, who was propagating together with Alberto Rivera, uh, 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 Francisco Ribera, the futurist uh, identification of the Antichrist. I cannot but take notice of the dishonesty of Cardinal Bellarmine, who in his third book of controversies brings in Cyprian as a defender of the murder of heretics, who having in his book concerning martyrdom cited that passage out of Deuteronomy 13, that the false prophet shall be slain, adds, if this was to be done under the Old Testament, much more under the New. But if we look to the words immediately following, we shall find that Cyprian's opinion was quite the reverse. For these are the words of Cyprian. If therefore the coming of Christ, the commands of worshipping God and forsaking idols, were to observed, how much rather are they to be observed since his appearance? Who not only exhorted us by word, but by his own actions. Yeah? Who not only asserted us by words, but by his own actions, and who, after having endured all manner of injuries and reproaches, was crucified, that he might leave us an example how to suffer and die, so that he hath no excuse who will not suffer on his own account. For as he suffered for the sins of all, how much more ought everyone to suffer for his own sins? If this passage be read entire, it will appear how very falsely Bellarmine had hath applied it to the defense of the murder of heretics, which was only intended as an exhortation to the patient suffering of martyrdom. Now, Lactantius defends the same doctrine in a nobler and plainer manner. In Liber 5, chapter 20, he says, quote, there is no need of compulsion and violence because religion cannot be forced, and men must be made willing, not by stripes, but arguments. Very important sentence. There is no need of compulsion and violence because religion cannot be forced, and men must be made willing, not by stripes, but arguments. Stripes is the sword, arguments is the word of God, the Bible. It's that easy, really, it is that easy. And people saw that all through the ages. So it is not difficult to identify the Antichrist for what it is. Let them draw the sword of their reason. If their reasons are good, let them produce them. We are ready to bear if they can teach. If they are silent, we cannot believe them. If they pretend to force us, we cannot yield to them. Let them initiate us or fairly de debate the case with us. This is not our manner, as they object to entice men. We teach, prove and demonstrate. No one is kept amongst us against his will, and he must be unacceptable, uh, and, he, uh, and he must be unacceptable to God, who wants devotion and faith, and yet not forsake us, being preserved by the whole evidence and forth of truth. And a little after, he writes, Let them learn from this what difference there is between truth and falsehood, in that they, though boasting of their eloquence, cannot persuade. Yet Christians, though unskillful and ignorant, can, for the thinking itself, and truth pleads in their behalf. 
To what purpose then is their rage, but to expose more that folly which they strive to conceal? Slaughter and piety are quite opposite to each other. To each other. Nor can truth consist with violence, or justice with cruelty. And a little after he says, They are convinced that there is nothing more excellent than religion, and therefore think that it ought to be defended with force. But they are mistaken, both in the nature of religion and in the proper methods to support it. For religion is to be defended not by murder, not by persuasion, not by cruelty, but by patience, not by wickedness, but faith. Those are the methods of bad men, these of good. And it is necessary that a religious man should be good and not evil. For if you attempt to defend religion by blood and torments and evil, this is not to defend, but to violate and pollute it. For there is nothing should be more free than the choice of our religion, in which, if the consent of the worshippers be wanting, it becomes entirely void and ineffectual. The true way, therefore, of defending religion is by faith, a patient suffering and dying for it. This renders it acceptable to God and strengthens its authority and influence. Unquote. This was that most harmless persuasion of the primitive Christians before the world had yet entered into the church and by its pomp and pride had perverted the minds and corrupted the manners of its professors. Now here we are going to stop our reading of today, of um, the history of the Inquisition, and continue next time in Chapter 3, The Laws of the Emperors, after the Nicene Council against the Arians and other heretics. And we will bring a little bit light into my false excusa uh, accusation in the beginning of reading chapter 1 where I didn't have the full understanding of who the Arians are and we will get more into that uh, next time when we read in the book History of the Inquisition by Philip von Limborch. I hope you enjoyed this reading it was a little difficult for me because I had no time to read this in advance and um, uh, didn't prepare and I was a little bit tired today so please forgive me if the reading was not that perfect I try to make it up next time but I hope that you enjoy the whole book and please always take your own copy with it and uh, just read along and then you will probably even get a better understanding by just listening to me but um, with this I'm gonna leave it and I thank you very much for your attention, for watching and, uh, and listening to the book reading of the history of the Inquisition from this wonderful historical book, Philip from Limborg, written in 1692. Until next time, Juggler 66 from Our of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye.